um, just a warm-up question. Could you just state your name and, and what you do in this ecosystem? In the ecosystem? You mean the, the global ecosystem? I, I think you're just in the, <laughs> in the top nest. Or the Schumacher, in Devon. Uh, the endeavor. Okay, well, my name is uh, Dr. Stefan Harding, and I've been teaching ecology here at Schumacher College since the beginning of the college, so for 30 years. And I've been teaching Gaia theory, deep ecology, eco-philosophy, holistic science. Um, and my background is, a, is as a scientific ecologist. Is that okay? Perfect. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> what a journey. <laughs> could, you, uh, can you, could you talk to us about some of, these, uh, some of the science, like you, maybe from your time in Oxford, and how did, how did this level of interest in sustainability kind of grow on you? Um, so yeah, well, I've always, I've always been interested in ecology since I was a child. You know, when I was young, uh, in London. We came to London when I was six from Venezuela and I was always very ashamed to be a human being because of the damage we, we were doing to the earth and that was that was in the 60s. I was already didn't want to be a human. I would much rather have been a pangolin or a, an anteater or something like that but I was a human so I was a bit ashamed of that because we were destroying things, so many things you know even then. Uh, and, you know, I was interested in science, so I did science. And um, I studied, at university, I studied zoology. Um, but before I went to university, I spent quite a bit of time in Africa, in uh, the Sengwa Research Station in what is now Zimbabwe. It was then Rhodesia. It was pristine in those days, completely untouched. It was unbelievable. All the big mammals were there, loads of birds. Fabulous. I spent eight months there helping David Cumming, who's a really excellent ecologist, with his study of warthogs. And I made a collection of small mammals and bats, which I didn't like doing because I had to kill them and stuff them. I hated doing that. Um, then I went to Durham University and did zoology. And after that, I went back to Venezuela, where I was born, and I worked with the Smithsonian Institution in the plains, the Llanos in Venezuela, which is a bit like Africa. And there, there are jaguars and there are giant anteaters and amazing birds and incredible amphibians and beautiful tropical paradise. Um, and then I came back to England, did my doctorate at Oxford on the muntjac deer, a small little deer from China in a wood near Oxford. And that was an amazing experience because I had this 40 hectare wood all to myself for about six years, I think it was. Uh, I lived there, had a little shed there, and I lived there for days and days and I studied my muntjac. Then I went to Costa Rica after that. And then I came back, uh, Costa Rica teaching ecology at the National University to students from all over Latin America in Spanish, sort of conservation biologists all from all over Latin America. One of them now, Eduardo Carillo, is one of, is one of the world's Jaguar experts. He's one of our students. And then I came back here not knowing what to do. And I just happened to hear about mm, Dartington and Satish Kumar and, what they were trying to set up an ecological inst institute for trying to explore why is humanity, why, why are Westerners, sorry, why are Westerners so destructive of nature? And what can we do about it? How can we cure ourselves from our destructiveness of nature? So they hired me as their ecologist, they needed an ecologist. I was the first one they met and they said, oh, you'll do, you know, would you like a job? So that's, that's how I got to be here. Is this the sort of thing you want? It's beautiful. Yeah, and the first person to teach at court, the, the first, sorry, the first, very first course at Schumacher College, to my amazement, was ch taught by James Lovelock. Because Satish you know, is very well connected with everybody, and he's a friend of James Lovelock. So James Lovelock was here teaching on the first course. I couldn't believe it, and it was absolutely amazing. So he and I had met several long walks, and we became good friends. And it was a time when his Gaia theory wasn't being taken very seriously by the scientific establishment. So he was glad to find a, a scientist like me who was very interested in his ideas and we started collaborating scientifically. So I would go off to his, his laboratory on the Cornwall, Cornwall Devon border, about an hour and a half west of here. Because he's an independent scientist so he didn't work for any institutions, he had his own lab. 
and he'd, he had about 13 or 14 acres of land which he'd planted with trees. It was completely wild in the middle of all this de decimated British countryside. There was a beautiful wildlife oasis which he'd created. And I used to go and spend hours and hours with him there and doing uh, science of Gaia, talking about the philosophy of Gaia, the spirituality of Gaia, going for long walks with him. And for about five years I collaborated with him on his Daisy World model, some sort of mathematical model of self-regulating Earth. Um, that was an incredible honour to work with him. He's really the most remarkable person, I must say. Could you speak to the science that he discovered and you discovered through him and with him and how this has really you know, grown? Like just if I didn't know anything about Guy. Yeah. Well, he, you see, what, what had happened in science was that the Earth was seen as a dead ball of rock, basically, with a thin smear of life on the surface before Lovelock. So it was just thought that life didn't have much influence on the planet. Because you know, how could it? It's just the planet is a huge ball of rock. Life is like a thin smear of paint on a, on a school globe, if you can imagine that. You know. How could that possibly have any influence on, on the, the temperature, composition of the atmosphere, etc. So the idea was the Earth was basically a ball of rock, dead, floating in space. Uh, but of course the more ancient idea from the medieval times and beyond, before, in ancient Greece and in all indigenous cultures, is that nature isn't dead, it's alive. That the Earth is alive, it's a living being. And so what Lovelock discovered was that um, we can think of the Earth as alive from a scientific point of view as well. Because he proposed that the, whole, the sum of all life, or rather the interactions between life, rocks, atmosphere and water, so the four components of the planet, life, atmosphere, rocks and water, they all interact with each other <coughs> through complex feedbacks. And the result of all those interactions is a sort of emergent property. And that emergent property is that the whole planet, as one great living system, is able to regulate its surface temperature, distribution of key elements, its acidity, because of these interactions between life, rocks, atmosphere and water. Uh, and that's a scientific way of saying that the Earth is alive. And he, he chose the name Gaia, which is the ancient Greeks' name for the divinity of the Earth, um, for his theory or his hypothesis, he called it the Gaia Hypothesis. And so through Lovelock, the ancient idea that the Earth is a great living being came back into Western culture after 2,000 years of exile. For about 2,000 years, mainstream Western culture saw the Earth as some kind of fallen, sinful place. That was the basic view in mainstream Christianity. You know, nature's sinful, bad. What we need to do is get ourselves to heaven, away from this material plane, full of suffering. We don't want to be here, we want to be in heaven with God. Um, so mainstream Christianity saw the earth as not as sacred. Of course, there are always people like St. Francis of Assisi and uh, Hildegard of Bingen, you know, Chris, great Christian saints who realized the earth was, a, was, a, was sacred and alive. But what Lovelock did was to bring back the idea or the insight that the earth is alive through science, through one of the very enterprises that try to suppress the sense of the sacred earth. So it's, the return of Gaia to our culture is incredibly important. I don't think we've caught, mainstream culture hasn't quite realized how important that is yet. Hopefully we will at some point soon. It's the, it's the idea we need to, to save us from the disaster that we're perpetrating on the world, that the earth is sacred, that the earth is alive, it's a living being, and that we can understand how it's alive through the science, as well as through poetry and through imagination and through uh, art. So Guy is very holistic. It's got a scientific aspect, it's got a, a mythological aspect, an artistic aspect, a poetic aspect. So Guy really is, I think, the big idea for Western culture, for our times, and we haven't quite realized it yet. Mm. So it was very significant that Lovelock taught the first course here. That's the foundation of the college is Gaia. And then I realised that my job at the college was to teach Gaia. Because when I first came here, I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. 
I mean, I cleaned lots of toilets and did lots of cooking and things, but I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. Then, once Lovelock had been here, I realised my, my job at Schumacher College is to teach Gaia. So that's what I did. I started studying the science of Gaia, the philosophy of Gaia, going to visit Lovelock and spending time with him. Then later, uh, Arne Ness came, the Norwegian philosopher, who coined the term deep ecology. And again, he and I became very good friends, and I went to Norway many times to be with him in his cabin high up in the mountains. And then I realised, oh, my job here is not only to teach Gaia, but to teach deep ecology. And the idea of deep ecology is that, um, you know, ecology is about science, it's about the facts about nature. But it doesn't tell you how you should live in relation to nature. I mean, facts don't tell you how you should live. They just tell you what the facts are. So Arnie put the word deep in, term, in front of ecology so we'd understand that we need values as well. Values are really important. Value, and how do we value nature? How do we value what ecology tells us? How do we value the aardvark, the pangolin, you know, the anteater, the birds? How do we value them? How do we live in relation to them? Science tells you nothing about that. But deep ecology does. So we, what Arnie did by coining the term deep ecology was reuniting fact and value. And these are two things that had been split apart during the scientific revolution by our dear French friend Descartes, who, who told us that um, the external world is dead. It has no soul. It has no value, in other words. And that the only thing that has value is the human intellect, which is connected to God, who's an engineer who's created the whole world like a, like a huge machine or a clockwork. So what Arnie did by coining the term deep ecology is he, he reunited fact and value, which is what we desperately need to do in our culture if we have any chance of surviving. I mean, all other cultures just about on the earth, non-Western cultures, have realized the earth is sacred, it's plain as the nose on your face. But we, we, we've lost that understanding. We just see... The only value we see in nature is whether we can make money out of it or not. If there's no money to be made, it has no value. So we have to, we have to change that. And then the third person who influenced me greatly um, was Brian Goodwin, a great uh, mathematical biologist. He came around about 1996 to the college and he wanted to set up a degree in holistic science, what we later called holistic science. So I helped him establish the MSc in holistic science. That was in 1998, and that was the first postgraduate program at the college, and it's still going on today. So anyway, that's a little bit about my, my history here. No, it's uh, beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, like it was, I never forget living up in the Seaberg Mountains and uh, not knowing what the Seaberg Mountains outside Cape Town with Cape Bishop, not knowing what Schumacher College was coming across ecology, guy theory, and how it changed our world, and how it like really is something to look towards as a, like in a in a way of like having something to look up to in knowledge that mm -hmm. really represents something for a future. And I think like it, I think that's really valuable. Is there anything that you would love for the world to understand that you might understand, but maybe the world needs to kind of move in this direction or say mm. through deeply love people to know? Well, yes. I think, um, you know, the main psychologist of we in Western culture is Freud. And of course, he was a genius and he had many great things to say. But it's about time we started listening to Jung. Jung is the, is the psychologist we should be listening to. Um, so what I'd like to say to people is that we need to understand, to solve the crisis, we need to understand something about our psyche, the human psyche, or the psyche in general. And, and Jung showed, along with many other people, that we have four primary functions, four primary ways of relating to nature and to each other. We've got thinking, which we're very familiar with, but opposite to thinking is feeling. And feeling is not emotion. It's really how we, whether we're able to value something, whether we can see its value, whether we can perceive the value of something. It's very much connected to a sense of beauty and meaning, and that's opposite to thinking. Then we have our intuition, and opposite to that is sensing, our sensory experience. Our intuition is um, 
knowing something without knowing how we know it. You know, it's sort of being able to look around corners in a way, or sort of perceive what might happen in the future, or what something is good for, or what something could become, but non-rationally. So we have these four ways of knowing. And if we want to be whole, if we want to solve the crisis, each of us has a responsibility to cultivate those four ways of knowing in ourselves as much as we can. And our culture just focuses on thinking and a certain style of thinking, which is mechanistic reductionist thinking, which is useful, and we don't want to throw it away, it's a useful tool, but if it's the only way we see the world, we get the result we've got now, which is an you know, incredible planetary catastrophe, because we've been using only thinking, and only a mechanistic kind of thinking. So we need to think, but we need to balance that with feeling. In fact, I would say now, feeling is more important than thinking. We need to perceive the value of the natural world. We need to see its beauty, see its meaning, feel it. By feel, I don't mean emotionally, I mean perceive it. It's hard to describe what that is. And we need to be intuitive and we need to be in touch with our sensory experience. So I think I would say what we need to do, each of us, is cultivate these four ways of knowing in ourselves. It's not easy. There's always as Jung pointed out, an inferior function, one, one of these four that we don't, haven't really cultivated very much. It's, it's the one we're not very good at. And it's not easy to cultivate the one you're not good at. For example, if you're good at thinking, you won't be good at feeling. I've seen that in the university system where I, where I was for so long. Some brilliant academics, you know, very good at thinking, useless at feeling, useless at relationships with their families and useless at um, really feeling things, you know seeing the value of things, particularly human relationships. So it's hard to, opposite, uh, cal cal sorry, it's hard to cultivate the inferior function, as Jung would say, but that's what we need to focus on. So I think we need to understand the human psyche much better than we do in our culture. We won't get out of this mess without understanding the psyche and the unconscious and what's going on in the unconscious. And for that, Jung is a great guide. I think it's about time we put Freud in his place. If you've got sexual problems, okay, go and hang out with Freud. I mean, but if you want to know the real treasure in the psyche, we need Jung. Freud said the unconscious is just a rubbish dump. Jung discovered, yes, there's a rubbish dump aspect to the unconscious, but it's also got the greatest treasures you could imagine in it, of which we're not conscious until we cultivate that connection. And actually, the unconscious is nature. It is, it is Gaia. It's the world of nature. So anyway, is that okay? That's beautiful. <laughs> I think it's so important. I think we go into, we undervalue the, our, our unconsciousness. Mm. There, there is great scientific standpoint, uh, standing behind you know, just solving problems by not thinking about them. Yes, no, that's right. And letting your mind just wander for a bit to do a mm -hmm. puzzle and coming back to it. Yeah, I, I think the unconscious is, is everything we're not aware of. Everything we don't, and we don't know very much, you know, even with all our science, we don't know very much. We're pretty, I mean, this is a great mystery. How did all this come to be? We have no idea. What is nature? We, ha we have no idea. What is matter? Well, we, quantum physics, it's, yes, okay. But what, what is matter? We don't really know. So, you know, we think 